No. We're now live. So thank you, Lord of Louth. Lord Norton has kindly joined us on the Big Wigs talk show. Um, so would you like to introduce yourself? I'm Philip Norton, Lord Norton of Louth, and I'm Professor of Government at the University of Hull. Nice, nice. So do you want to dive straight into like um, sort of like your life and how you grew up and stuff like that, starting from the the school age sort of thing, like what school did you go to and like the sort of interests and hobbies you was into at right. a young age? Well, your question presumes I grew up, but uh, <laughs> um, yes, uh, well, I'm Lord Norton of Louth, and there's a reason for that, because I was born and brought up in Louth, uh, in Lincolnshire, um, small uh, market town with quite a, a extensive history, and I was fortunate to, um, in my day we had the 11 plus, so very fortunate to pass that, uh, so I went to uh, Louth Grammar School which itself has a distinguished history. So old boys include you know, Tennyson, uh, Captain John Smith, who founded Virginia, the explorer John Franklin. So um, quite steeped uh, in um, education. Uh, so uh, I went to grammar school. Um, and while there, I developed uh, my interest in politics, which actually was already there. So I'm one of these nerds who's been interested in politics since uh, since I was about 10 or 11. I was writing to politicians when I was about you know, 11, 12. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. Oh. And uh, so uh, solely immersed in politics, fascinated by that. So that was the driving force. I actually got active in politics from about the age of 13. Um, and so I was doing political activity as well as studying um got my a levels um uh, so the only outside interest i mean i did some sport i, I played table tennis including um in certain national uh competitions but otherwise it was just politics was the uh driving interest and so naturally that influenced my choice of degree so i went to do politics and i did it at sheffield because that had people there who specialized in my areas of interest cause, uh, particularly uh uh, the UK Parliament, um, so there's some well-known figures there, Bernard Crick, who had written a seminal work on the subject, uh, uh, Stuart Walkland, S.A. Walkland. So it's ideal for my purposes, so really immersed myself in that. Very fortunate, I was the only student in my year to get first. Um, and so that provided the prompt for being able to stay in the academic world. So instead of going down a, so what we might call a political route, a political activity, Sort of, um, I went down the academic route yeah, of, yeah. of studying uh, politics, teaching politics. So, um, uh, so I was fortunate then in getting um, what was then the Social Science Research Council uh, grant to do a, a doctorate. So I stayed at Sheffield because that had everything I needed for my areas of interest to do. So was that doctorate. Sheffield University? Yes. Yeah. So I did my doctorate at Sheffield University. I interrupted it because I selected. I got a Tehran scholarship that enabled me to go to the United States. So I went to the University of Pennsylvania to do a master's degree. And how long was that for? That I'd managed to do that in the year because that's what I had really because of the doctorate. I just needed to be fairly concentrated so i managed to do that within the year so i got a master's degree so that gave me an extra string to my bow because they specialize in uh or add to my specialization so my prime specialization british politics particularly parliament um but i also have a second string in terms of american uh politics i came back finish off my doctorate at the same time as offered a, a temporary lectureship at sheffield uh, so i was combining the two so and then um <coughs> quite a long time ago uh, i i got my uh, there was a the, the post advertised at hull university um in politics although it's primarily comparative politics but i applied um interviewed and there's quite a story about um i almost didn't do it again get to the interview because i was away um in those days we didn't have modern technology for keeping contact so as, was, we, as we do now. as we do now <laughs> so i'd been away i got back my parents rang up so oh, there's a there's a letter and there's a telegram waiting for you um oh right so i'd quickly go home to this was over a weekend i think it went home on the sunday opened the letter it's to an inv be interviewed for this post at hull the telegram was chasing up on it are you coming to the interview which was the next on the monday I was reading this on the Sunday. So, oh, right. So I had to quickly 
arrange to get over to Hull that night, um, stay at what was then the, I think, the Newland Park Hotel, which is now the old Grey Mare, just opposite the university. So uh, it was all very rushed. So I arrived, um, because I had to meet members of staff on the Monday morning, so I had to go up on the Sunday, and then after formal interview in the afternoon, uh, there are other candidates being interviewed. So had I not, had my parents not got back and phoned me and said this was waiting for you, I might have not been able to get to the interview in time in the event I did. Um, so they interviewed, I think, four candidates. They called me back in, offered the job. Uh, and I've been at Hull since, and that was 1977. Um, so how old, how old would you have been there then? Uh, 26. 26. Uh, when I started at, yeah, I came to Hull, yes. So, um, so it allowed me to develop my, because uh, I was already... Uh, done my PhD. I do- actually already published my first book. So that was based on research I'd done for my doctorate, um, and then later my doctorate itself was published as a book. Um, so I got appointed um, to Hull, um, specialised, I say, in, in, in Parliament, particularly parliamentary behaviour, but wider interest in the Conservative Party and the Constitution. Uh, so I taught, researched those areas, and carried on publishing so i was producing um quite a number of books you've got it says on the on the wikipedia page of hull it says 35 that you've edited or published yes that's 35 not including new editions so occasionally you know the you update them you produce a new editions so if you include new editions it's about 48 oh, right because one of the books is now in its 10th edition another went into its fifth edition and so on so yeah 35 sort of first editions um and some done very well, uh, particularly because they were geared to you know, student market. I did the Constitution in Flux, which is actually written for an American market. So Longman in the USA was a publisher and that did very well. So um, at the time, it was the leading book on British politics that was sold in the United States. I did a book on the Constitution called The Constitution in Flux, yeah, yeah. which... which um, covered not just politics, but it had a quite wide market apparently among uh, law student, so it's on a lot of law courses. Um, so developed my teaching research. I think I was quite productive. Also um, develop, uh, introduced a parliamentary placement program, given my area of specialisation. Uh, so we started. I started that about 1988. So for over 30 years, got this uh, uh, degree program, a four-year degree cr- program, where the third year is spent on placement in Westminster. Um, and some of the other students can also go down for a, you know, one term, one semester. Uh, we have a scheme for that, which introduced later. So um, uh, developed that. So um, and the university very kindly kept promoting me. Um, I probably stayed anyway, but I, I, I'm a love. Um, the university is fantastic place to work and get on and research. Uh, You've been here for for quite a while now, haven't you? Yeah, forty five years. Uh, well, actually, it's forty five years. This autumn so last september the first would be the 45th anniversary so since you've been here for 45 years have you seen like a, a, a drastic change like ups and it's obviously downs and sort of thing like oh, what yeah. was it like when you first ever came well it's what it's like now uh smaller um both in i mean both physically the campus um and student numbers um but it was fairly compact it's a very nice campus always has been very attractive um so it's expanded yes quite a number of changes over the years um one of the things with being here so long is that um things you you recognize things comes in cycles so somebody comes along and oh we've got this new idea we'll do x and i think oh yes x again we did that 20 years ago um (laughs) but uh, student numbers have expanded when i came here in 77 it's only about three or four thousand students um and the campus itself is not wasn't as large as it is now so at the time the university library which is the sort of key building and obviously the ta- is the tallest on campus was on the edge of the campus and next door we had what i think when i arrived probably was an institute of higher education then became humberside polytechnic then it became the university of humberside then the university of humberside and lincolnshire and then became the university of lincoln and moved to lincoln but physically obviously the site remained there so the university of hull acquired the site uh, so we got rid of the hedge that separated uh, the two institutions and so the other site was then integrated 
into the campus so the library is now sort of in the middle of campus yeah, yeah. rather than on the edge which i think is and you know, highly appropriate so that's the core point uh, in the middle of the uh, campus so campus expanded i think the other site has been integrated extraordinarily well into the university and the other big feature has been the movement of all our student halls of residence onto the site onto the campus itself um because when i arrived halls of residence were scattered in cottingham at the lawns there are other halls of residence out there clements and another thwait hall um so our halls of residence were dispersed i mean it's fairly easy to come in but nonetheless some distance away whereas in recent years the emphasis has been on new build bringing in state-of-the-art um halls of residence having them on the campus mm. complementing student houses in nearby streets cranbrook avenue auckland avenue which were there in, in, when i first arrived um so it's now very much everything's on site all the academic buildings uh, halls of residence the playing fields across the road so um it's very compact university uh, not too cramped so we're not like a civic center site where there's um you know split side high-rise buildings or anything like that and we're not a new, new university so we're not miles out from anywhere mm. um we're actually unusual i think in where we are located because it's so convenient so we're not stuck on the city centre site with problems of space, but we're not miles from anywhere. Um, been able to expand on site, but it's quite spacious, plenty of greenery. Uh, we're not too far from town, so it's fairly easy to get in um, to the city. Uh, so it, it, it all comes together rather well. So the developments over the years have very much um, added to what the university can offer so ups and downs over the years in terms of uh, funding student numbers things like that but um on the whole uh, come through it well um with a very attractive campus and a culture that's very student oriented very friendly i mean many years ago i think it was the daily telegraph described the university of Hull as the friendly university oh, and right. there's certainly a culture there that students feel they belong there's that sense of identity you know commitment to the university so when they graduate there's a strong sense of loyalty to the institution yeah yeah. um so that's always been a very marked feature so we've always invested heavily in making an attractive environment for our students um so everyone benefits the students enjoy it they feel part of it they feel committed uh, hull itself benefits the university is one of the major employers obviously but having so many students now living locally contributes enormously to the local economy as well yeah yeah so i think uh you know, we benefit because they were not stuck in the center so students aren't that obvious causing problems or anything like that um so where we are works well students i think strong sense of commitment they like the area um feel very comfortable in hulks they notice people are very friendly um <laughs> whether, whether whether they get used to the hull accent yeah yeah, yeah. And, um because i mean people move to hull but you have to be born and bred in hull to have the hull accent yeah um people moving to hull don't acquire it. but um i think people do tell students tend to notice just how friendly an environment it is that they feel quite comfortable here. I was saying about the... You'll, you'll know this person behind you. <laughs> the the president of the um, politics society. Yes. Um, now, we've had, again, that's the great feature of life here. Students get very involved, a whole range of student activities. Our own politics society is um, uh, one of the most active, one of the most successful uh, and, and always has been because our students are very much involved very committed and another feature is that sort of friendly environment is the extent to which even though students may hold different political views they still got on very well together so yeah, yeah. you know the the conservative society lib dem society labor society will organize joint events and go oh, on right. socials together because although they might have different views they still got on well together so they recognize so they could share each yeah, other well they recognize you know, they're not oh, i'm not talking to you because you support some other view they recognize you can have differences of opinions while getting on well personally yeah, so, yeah. And that's always been a feature here so that's why i think it's made for a very good uh 
environment. I think because I had Carl Turner on um, on the fri- on the Friday. And yeah. he, he made this point. He was like, uh, "Won't won't exactly like agree with the the views, but I have a lot of friends who are on like you know different oh, yes. parties and stuff yeah. like that who are like close." But he was like, "Some of them." Might talk to them in the office, but wouldn't drink a pint with. But. Oh right, yeah. Whereas here, they 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 do go out drinking. Um, <laughs> so no, they they got on uh, very well. It makes for a very good um, environment. So they attract uh, the public society. You know, attract uh, leading political figures to come up and speak, and they get a very good reception because the students just keen to listen to engage with them. So I was talking to one leading. Uh, figure um, it was before the pandemic um, but we'd been at a reception this is in Westminster he's leaving and I said oh you were in Upin Hill recently and he said yes it's wonderful you know that they were all very friendly because this was a politician quite controversial been to other universities where there'd been a bit of trouble but oh, oh it's all very friendly and just thought it was wonderful yeah 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 so a very good environment and just gives a very good impression was you uh, was you part of any societies in the when you was at university? Is it uh, Sheffield? Yes. Was it Sheffield? It was Sheffield. So yeah. Sheffield for three years was it? Um, three years for the first degree. Um, I was actually um, it was a very good year because one of my fellow students was David Blunkett. Oh. You know who went on to be uh, well, he's a local politician. He's at the time, but then went to be an MP, Labour MP, and Home Secretary, um, and he's now in the Lords. So we got on very well together because I mean he's blind. He had a guide dog. Oh, uh, wow. I, I, I still remember she, the guy Doug was called Ruby. It was an unusual year. There were very few st- in those days, not lots of students, very few doing that, you know, the degree, um, two of whom were blind. Um, one had a stick and David had a guide dog, Ruby. Um, but, you know, um, so yes, that was a three year degree, graduating, and I stayed on to do the doctorate. So, uh, I mean, David Blunkett's conscious he went down the politics route of you know, standing for election, going into the Commons. I went down the academic route of being a lecturer. Um, but it's still gone on well because he's Labour, I'm Conservative, but we've always got on well and we do have shared interests, particularly in um, ensuring active citizenship, teaching of citizenship in schools, making sure that sort of um, is an intrinsic feature. And, that should be better resourced than it is. So, yes, we, it was three years at uh, Sheffield while I was there. Um, so was there, like, other, other activities you joined yes, in? So, well, like, other societies, yeah, any I was, sports clubs and yeah, stuff like I, that? Yeah, well, the table tennis club, I was captain of the team. Um, Did you go competing and stuff like that then? Oh, yeah, it was all going around other universities, you know, competing against them. Um, what was the score? Like, did you win most? It depends who we're playing. I remember we actually came to Hull. Um, that was my first time I'd ever been to Hull was when we came to play um, against the whole team. <laughs> and I think it was the year when they had something like the Belgian champion as an undergraduate, um, something like that. Um, uh, and I remember we had problems finding the campus. Uh, so I was in the Tep Tennessee, but the other, uh, apart from being in the Conservative uh, Society, um, I was in the Debating Society. Uh, right, so what was this then? Well, that was... Um, as you might, as the name rather suggests, it wasn't so much concerned with the substance of an issue. It was actually honing one's debating skill. So we'd have a subject to debate, and we'd have different people then coming along and um, debating it. So somebody would argue one side, somebody would argue the other. So I say essentially honing one's skills. Yeah, uh, yeah. In debate. So just having a conversation around a sense of subject. Yeah, yeah. And how do you debate? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, engaging with others, how do you craft a speech, that type of thing. Um, oh, so. that'd, be, that'd be good to have, because I'd love, I'd love, like, debates and stuff like that, and, like, you know, sort of other people's views, yeah. and it's trying to find, like, you know, they dig down, because it's... Oh, yeah. Because nowadays, a, it's so easy just to twist the truth, or, like... Oh, absolutely. To yeah. follow a trend. And there are different ways of debating, different skills you can hone. Um, so, yeah, so it's all geared, apart from the... Table tennis, which is very good for you know, fitness, being active. Uh, otherwise, all the my activity was basically geared to politics. Right, right. Was there anything else you tried out then? Anything other than the table tennis? Anything else like you oh, no, no, dabbled was, in? Oh, no. I'm just, just a one track pony. I mean, I mean, I was. It's politics. If it's not politics, I wasn't really interested. So yeah, I've yeah. always been uh, solely engaged with that because that's just what I'm interested in. It drives me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just absolutely fascinated by it. Um, and once you get into research, you're engaging in finding material that's, or uh, you have findings that have not been 
discovered before. Yeah, so yeah. original research, you're analysing kind of particularly data, because my specialisation was looking at parliamentary voting behaviour, which meant looks at meant, which meant looking at uh, division lists in the House of Commons, so how MPs had voted. Because at the time, we didn't have um, current means of record. You know, so electronic electronically, you can keep a note of votes, or they can be recorded electronically now, and you can process the numbers very quickly. So I spent two years doing research, which nowadays you could do in a you know, matter of minutes on uh, a bit online. Um, but I was going through just lists of names of how MPs had voted because they were published on paper, and all you had was a list of names. Right, right. It didn't even say which party the mem- you know, the MPs were members of, so yeah, I, yeah. I had to know that. So I'd keep looking you know, each year the several hundred votes so i had to go through all each list going through several hundred names at times having to know which part each member was uh, oh, well. <laughs> um to to work out who was not voting with their own side because i was looking at dissenting voting behavior because that's what my phd was on um to analyze that how extensive was it had it changed why what explains why mps in the early 1970s suddenly became more independent in their voting behavior well of course I had to prove check their voting behaviour to see there was a change that's why so I went through um, division lists from 1945 onwards because obviously if you could look at 774 to know if there's a change you have to look at what preceded it to yeah, know yeah. what it changed from so I went through basically several thousand division lists and I estimate and I probably that probably meant I was going through a million million or more names oh wow um, to analyse their behaviour which was quite time consuming uh, and basically I was underground doing it because the university um resources i was using which was hansard the parliamentary debates as well as uh paper copies of the times to check you know reporting of the activity and so on were in a stack stack three i think it was sort of underground below the main library so I, yeah, yeah in the morning i'd go in down the steps into the stack and just spend all day um there analyzing division lists so um sort of spent two years underground basically um <laughs> So, but that produced um, both uh, a massive volume of data, which is my first book. It was essentially the data of who was how they were voting, who were the dissenters, and what you know on what issues. Uh, then the second book was the doctoral thesis itself, analysing that behaviour and seeking to explain it. Then produced a third book on voting behaviour. Then I looked at the next Parliament. Um, so that was my area of specialisation. Yeah, That's yeah. what just. Uh, I'd like to dig so, down on the on the books because yeah. I've I've seen the office and I've heard a number of because um, I used to be I used to work for uh, uni and there was a yeah. story all the time you moved office oh I, I have moved office yes and uh, the amount of time it took them just to move your books <laughs> was a very time and labouring task I'm sure yeah. so do you know how many books you have in total because it's not just the bookshelf. There's a oh, bookshelf no. behind. There is, yeah, the bookshelf, yeah. and there's an annex as well. Uh, so it's a big office and a smaller office, uh, all combined. Because um, yeah, when I came to Hull, I was in another, yeah, the Wilberforce Building on campus, normal size office. Um, then a bigger office further down the corridor came available, and I was allocated that because I said the university very kind of kept promoting me, so I got became a professor very early. I was the youngest professor of politics in the country when I was appointed, um, and. Youngest person to be a, in the parliament. Oh, not when I got... In the UK, apparently. No, not when I... I was the youngest professor of politics in the UK, yeah, when I got the chair. Um, I mean, later I got a peerage because of my work in constitutional issues. Cause that, um, so I was relatively young joining the House of Lords, but not the youngest. Uh, but I was the youngest professor of politics when I got promoted to the chair here because um, last year was my 35th anniversary of getting the professorship um, anyway I got a larger office but um, my book collection just kept expanding because yeah. more and more books are now published on politics in my you know, uh, interest to me and the only thing I ever spend money on really are books and some travel um, so uh, so my office you know, it was floor to ceiling bookcases then I was very fortunate because I got funding from Higher Education Funding Council, um, a grant to um, adapt uh, uh, the room next door to mine, which the faculty said, yeah, you can have if you spare. So and I got this funding to sort of knock through to it. So it became sort of an annex. So my office ex- sort of doubled in size that accommodated 
the book collection because otherwise it was sort of piling up on the floor and um, sort of making it a problem for students because I always teach teach by extended seminar normally and the students come into my room I teach in my room and they could it was a case of seeing me you know having to peer over the books to see you <laughs> um, so yeah I acquired this annex um, and then um, last year the department moved because the faculty came together in one of the buildings on the university site that was originally you know the polytechnic university side, whatever so um so we moved over to a, a splendid building and i was given this magnificent office very large um lovely feature fireplace um looks incredible from the outside like oh, you've got your little tea set like oh yeah it is massive yeah conference table like oh yeah yeah that's say from a student point of view they can all come in because i teach in the room they come in got the table oh so you teach in there then oh yeah yeah uh, right i always teach it yes because it, it's it makes a nice en- environment you know book lined room sit at the table get the laptop so these out. is where these two would yeah oh yeah yes and i've always served tea and coffee ever since i started teaching so and, th- and nowadays the traditions come in that those who are giving the students who are giving a paper make cakes or bake cakes for the class this is what i was going to ask you yeah well so, uh, it became a tradition quite, quite a few years ago because i've always let la- yeah always laid on refreshments but then student who was giving a paper decided to bring in a cake and suit next week not wanting to be outdone brought in a cake so it sort of developed from there um where st- and students really started to become very inventive in baking cakes you know thinking what their specialized specialized speciality in cake making was or thinking about the theme of the class could they bake a cake theme to the class yeah yeah so you know one student who's very good at baking produced um a cake in the shape of a ballot box when we're discussing electoral reform um and put ballot box on but gave people rice paper so they could vote and then put it in the ballot that was part of what they could eat uh we've had cakes in the shape of the house of commons the house of lords um uh two students one got together and actually did one in the uh shape of the palace of westminster it's very big uh, and very rich because it's sort of iced um so yeah so we've got some very inventive um students when it comes to baking how, how long ago was this then when did it first start um it was over 10 years ago it's been going at least a decade or so so this uh, is proper tradition now then. oh it is yeah oh yeah they get very good at, so we tweet pi- i tweet pictures as well just seeing the brownies yeah well they uh, there was also um, <laughs> i say they're very inventive i mean they're either good bakers or they know good bakers or they're just very good friends of mr kipling um there was an issue that there was <laughs> the bike well there was an issue last year because in the morning class one of the students had spent a lot of time baking a cake a very nice cake for the students yeah, yeah put that on twitter it got quite a lot of likes because we've got quite a national indeed i think international following in the afternoon <laughs> the student giving the paper brought in colin the caterpillar <laughs> which aesthetically looked quite attractive so i thought well you know he's quite cool i'll tweet that as well so i tweeted what he brought in he got more likes so the student in the morning then tweeted should we re- really be showing pictures of bought cakes <laughs> <laughs> And um, uh, and a recent class this year, it was um, a similar thing where there's a bought cake and, 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 and who should comment on it? Do you really think this is a... Uh, uh, and it was the student from last year and then another student commented, well, I'm not surprised, you know, guess, um, why am I not surprised you're commenting? So um, uh, oh, the, the one that got the most likes actually was about a couple of years ago. student came in, got one of the plates or saucers just t- tipped out a full a full uh, a few maltesers and that was it it was and everybody was just looking there's just a few maltesers but i it was so unusual i tweeted it <laughs> that got the most like, <laughs> so the maltesers yeah, the winner yeah because it was just so odd yeah yeah um so yeah they they um very inventive so nature's part of the tradition so students come in they've got cake tea coffee it makes them very relaxed so it's very good for this you know in a nice room got a conference table and get laptops out um and very uh, uh aesthetically pleasing environment so they just feel very comfortable so it makes it easy for them to get into discussion on the uh subject because yeah i mean the students giving the paper devote a lot of time to the paper as well as the cake so it's, yeah 
they really put a lot of effort into what they're uh, doing. So, yeah, it makes for a, a great environment. So um, before you come uni, you get a catering qualification. Well, you leave it. <laughs> you, you, I like to think I turn out students who are well-rounded in the sense yeah. that not just academically able, but socially able, because they can turn their hands to, you know, making the tea, coffee, producing cake, whatever. Um, so, yeah, just... Um, and because of the parliamentary placement programme, those going on placement come back fairly self-assured, they can look after themselves. So just the skills they've got makes them highly employable. Yeah, they yeah, can yeah. turn the hand to so much. They know the subject, they know about networking, good at problem solving, uh, time management, interpersonal skills, and I say social skills, uh, as well as intellectual skills, which they've honed in class. So the way I teach, because everybody contributes to the discussion, they learn to make a case, to articulate their own views on a subject, because uh, I'm not there to tell them what to think, I just help them to know how to think. Yeah. Um, to reach their own conclusions, just help them to get there. But they reach their own conclusions. But yeah, they can debate them. So, just skills that employers want and know they've got. I so. think this, I think the social the social at the minute is like probably the most important. Well, what employers look for the various things, and not least communication skills, mm. very important. So, Which is literally the whole reason why I'm doing this. Yeah. is to adapt my skills on on talking and listening because. Yeah. Before, like, when I was, like, you know, 16, I couldn't even produce, like, a sentence sort oh, of thing. Quite. So once you learn to articulate, you develop and you realise, I can do that. Because mm. quite often it's a lack of confidence. And first-year students will be quite often sat there very quietly thinking, everybody else sounds very intelligent. I have no idea what's going on. Yeah, yeah. All, I also point out the person sat next to them is probably thinking exactly the same <laughs> thing. Because... You always think, oh dear, no, not me, but everybody else sounds very intelligent. But they're all thinking exactly the same thing. So it's realising, yes, I've got views that are as valid as anybody else. I know I've honed my skills in researching, being able to justify uh, my argument and develop anal analytic skills. And I also point out students, when you know, it comes to marking essays, their research projects, they're not marked on the, the conclusion they've reached. They're marked on how well they've reached the conclusion. Yeah, right. So they might end up with very different views to somebody else, but their argument is very well structured, uh, well researched. They've got their material to make their case. They've demonstrated they know what the alternative, the counter argument is to which they can respond uh, and in order to reach their conclusion. So, yes, it really builds up confidence as they learn those skills of communication, whether it's in writing or in class discussion, which then gives them the confidence to go out for interview and... Uh, explain themselves, justify themselves, and deploy those skills in whatever job they want to do. So talking about employment and stuff like that, when you go back to, obviously, like school, did you go from school straight to uni, or was there, like, a little gap where... Most students go straight to university. This is fairly... The, this is the norm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you do get some who have... So yourself? Oh, I went straight, yeah. I mean, I'm just... I said the academic route, I was just... So school, I, uni, so didn't, yeah. do you have anything on the side, like, or is it just, so how did you fund the uni then? Oh, in those days, um, it was, fun, uh, as long as you got the A-levels requisite, it was uh, publicly funded. So no such things as student fees or anything like that, because those days, um, I was very fortunate, because a relatively small proportion of the population went to university. Mm. So, uh, so if you went to uni, you'd be considered the... A yeah. success sort of thing yeah well yes i mean the um uh, the proportion it was only a minority so it's only later um really uh, this century that we've gone towards you know 50 percent of the cohort age cohort you know getting university education i think in my days was it 15 20 percent that sort of oh, thing well. of the age cohort yeah so i was very fortunate um in being accepted for university um and once I got to university, that was really the key point because that was when I sort of realised, if like my intellectual skills, I really developed it intellectually at university and, and did well, and so just built on that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was a sort of continuous path of just so just pure. Did, yeah, just pure. Uh, well, I mean, I'm saying I'm on track page. It's all politics. I want to study politics. That I want to get university, study politics, got my degree, want another, you know, higher degree in politics, yeah, yeah. so I can go on to the academic So when you went world. for your master's then, you went to, Ameri was it America? Yeah. yeah. 
What, how did you like fund the American trip then? Well, I was very did fortunate because you... I applied for one and was successful in getting a Tehran scholarship. So there are various scholarships available for students to go to the United States, a very limited number. Um, so it's Tehran, Harvard, Kennedy scholarships. Yeah, yeah. So I applied, got a Tehran scholarship. Um, Does that give you a amount of money then? Like yes. a bunch of money oh, to like yeah, live off? Uh, oh, yeah, very much so. Um, yeah, because otherwise uh, universities in the States are not cheap yeah so, yeah so i was very fortunate because that the scholarship funded yeah everything i mean the fees uh living costs so you got so much per month and was so, that enough to live off or? yes oh yeah oh is it like comfortable then it was in those days yeah uh, well, it was still reasonably good because i um because i believe in putting things back to you know institutions that you've helped me so i'm still a governor of my school and i've been for about 30 years I'm on my second second stint as the warden of the school, and I'm on the Tehran selection yeah, yeah. panel now for choosing students who are going over to on Tehran scholarships, um, and I've been for for many years. Um, so now it's very successful. I got Tehran scholarships that funded me to go over for the year nice. to get a different type of education, yeah, which yeah. was intrinsically interesting itself. How do how does the American educational system work? Yeah, but at the yeah, same yeah. time, substantively to study American politics and just to get a feel for the states. I'd been before because um, just after I started my PhD studies, um, I was selected just to go. Um, it's funded by the American State Department. They were identifying what they presumably thought were young scholars across who might end up being high flyers or something. And it uh, definitely was. <laughs> well, they funded us to go and just follow the 1972 presidential election campaign so they flew us around the whole of the states and you know, uh quite fascinating um so i've got that experience that just whetted my appetite to carry on doing something in american politics so yeah so i applied for a toronto scholarship very fortunate um because the way the interviews for toronto scholarships are done is quite intensive with the others you probably went along just had one interview and that was it we're toronto scholarships at the time it's sort of a weekend of interviews uh, having a panel listen to you pres- do a paper presentation you debate with other students you met members of the Tehran family and things like that um, so it's quite intensive and I was fortunate to get the scholarship um, so yes that funded me to go over so I just opted for the masters. Nice, nice. What was you most looking forward to when you went over and over to America? What was your like what was the first thing that came to your mind like oh I'm going to America oh, I can do this um, It was the fascination because I'd all been fascinated with politics, particularly British politics, but also sort of American politics. So it's really to get a feel for that um, and just to get a sense of, I suppose, the American higher education system and perhaps to hone skills mm. that were different from the ones I did here, which actually worked out extraordinarily well, but it wasn't necessarily planned. But because one of the courses I did was very much on quantitative methods, which proved very useful for the data I'd researched as part of my PhD. So I was able to apply that. That worked out uh, extremely well. But that was um, fortuitous. I didn't actually know that was going to be the result. Um, So I didn't really go with any fixed view. It was really adding to my educational experience, my awareness, my understanding of politics, uh, um, just getting that additional uh, insight um, on the American side, yeah, yeah, and that worked out, um, you know, pretty well. Nice. So, Did- yeah. So I say, just one of those things. I decided I would apply, got it, um, was able to you know, just hold the doctorate for a year. The funding was suspended for a year while I went over, and then resumed when I got back. That's why I had to do it within the year, right? Because of the funding across here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you went to, like, American stuff, did you just, like, travel around as well? Like, did you just visit other states? Well... Or was it just in the... Well, well, when I went in 72 for the presidential election campaign, yeah, when uh, we were taken, obviously, Washington, but um, different parts of the country, because we went down to the Deep South, to Alabama. Uh, we actually met George Wallace, who'd been governor of Alabama, very controversial... Right, uh, who'd actually been shot during the presidential election campaign. Is that because of the si- things he said, or was it just... Right? Yeah, I think so, yeah. He right. was very controversial. Um, um, so we were some of the first people to see him while he was yeah, recovering after being shot. So he was in a wheelchair. It was quite surreal, because he was in a wheelchair. So he had to keep lifting himself up to get traction, you know, part of his 
um, recovery. So he's in the wheelchair, pushing himself up and down occasionally. But he's also going deaf, which was unrelated to yeah, the shooting or anything. So, so to ask him a question, we had to put the question to his press secretary, who then stands several yards in front of him and shout the question at him. <laughs> um, so that in itself was quite bizarre. And one of the questions, which might be a little insensitive, was someone basically said to him, what do you think of gun control now then? Because he'd been an opponent of gun which control. Is, he, he thought which is fair. Yeah, but... Uh, and his response was, well, chap who shot me, never referred to him by name, he said the chap who shot me would have, you know, even if we'd had gun control, and say, would have gone somewhere like Canada to get a gun. We were there thinking, yeah, but that's a long way away. It might actually yeah, be yeah. a deterrent. So he's basically but, saying, if he was going to shoot me, he was going to shoot me. With, with the thing. law or without the yeah, law. Yeah, so, so, well, we should have, yeah, so, well, yeah, people should be allowed to have guns, that type of argument, which didn't impress us but um so anyway it's slightly surreal so uh deep south we went to california went to san francisco uh, amazing city which i've been back to a number of times particularly because um i used to go every year to the american political science association conference which is in different parts of the state so again that was fascinating but that tour went to san francisco went to michigan um yeah i think we ended up in new york so we got rounds so that was good when yes when i was uh, studying there is mainly based in the University of Pennsylvania, which is Philadelphia. Um, spent some time in New Jersey, and got up to Washington, so on. Uh, and then uh, with an American drove, or he did all the driving actually, drove more or less coast to coast. So Philadelphia on the east, we went over to across, drove across the states to Los Angeles, and then I, I, I flew back from there. So yes, got around. Um, nice. Then and then, since when I went to the APC conferences, there in different places, you know, Washington, Chicago, Atlanta, San Francisco, um, Boston. Um, so yeah, got around different parts of the states. What was your favourite part of America when you visited? Oh, and also one year did a I was invited to do a sort of lecture tour so the Midwest. So I d- from s- flew out to St. Louis and then um, drove around to the different universities I was speaking at. So the Midwest was fascinating. So, um, well, the states, I mean, Washington, D.C., the central part, the government part, very impressive, you know, really fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the most attractive city, I always think, in San Francisco. Right. It's somewhat continental. It's not typically American, but aesthetically, I mean, it's just absolutely... Well, part, I mean, some of it, like most American cities... There are parts that are really, you know, run down, tremendous social problems. But you know, the parts leading down to the bay, things like that. Where would you avoid next time? Where have you ever been somewhere where you're just like, never come in here again? Well, it wasn't so much that, but it's very divided. I mean, when I was staying with a friend in Washington, D.C. one year, he said, don't go beyond that particular block. It's unsafe. So right. it's remarkable, you know, there's unsafe. Once you're this side of the road, it's safe, that type of thing. Oh, right. oh, That's yeah. how different it is. Oh, yes. Yeah, and in... Um, Philadelphia got certainly got that and partly it was, there was um, the sort of different racial groupings different groupings as well so um, some tensions um, so you knew where to go where not to go yeah, I mean, yeah. two of the other Tehran scholars that my year they were there my year um, so we're out cy- by cycling in part of Philadelphia and a police car drew up alongside. They're, what are you doing here? We're just outside. Get out as quickly as possible. It's not safe. You and know, these are police? Yeah, the police were telling him it's not safe for you two to be cycling in this part of the city. So um, there was that. And yeah, there was once, I was once driving, um, I think I was going was it through New Jersey, and following the signs, and I think I took a wrong direction and ended up in a neighbourhood. He looked around and thought, I'm not sure this is... Yeah, I'm a bit so, lost here. <laughs> well, um, more, I'm not. I'm not sure it's safe to be driving through this area. So yeah, so unfortunately, got out. But um, so there are very clear tensions of that. No gunshot wounds then. When you no, <laughs> no, no, no. I just looked around. And this is not perhaps. So, so that's so surreal though, to think like because we don't have that in the UK. Really, not, like, not the same extent. You know, areas that look a bit. Yeah, unsafe, and and obviously there's certain areas that some people, you know, people would not feel secure walking in, you know, late at night or anything yeah. like that. Um, I mean, uh, to some extent, it's an attitude of mine because when I was in Philadelphia, um, the campus was in walking distance of the city centre, um, and occasionally I'd you know, walk 
kid, well, a regularly walk in, and if okay, sometimes, yeah, at night, walk in. Um, more like to be going to the train station, if I'd been somewhere, something like that. Uh, didn't particularly worry me, but other people would take, oh, yeah, they wouldn't dare walk the streets when it was dark in yeah. the centre. So it's part of an attitude of mind. But some areas, yeah. Um, the crime statistics at the time, you know, pretty horrendous. Um, so, yeah, you have to be um, careful. Yeah, yeah. Because there are those um, uh, areas uh, and um, tension. So it was, um, yeah, it was an issue in certain areas, yes. So going from that, where would you want to go next? Or have you been around the world? Have you visited everywhere? Uh, no. Um, Is this somewhere on your bucket list where you'd like to go? No. Um I've been because, you know, I only, tr- I do lots of travel, not because I think, oh, I'd like to go there. Right. I go because I've been invited there. Uh, right. So it's sort of lots of travel around the globe, incidental to being invited to go and speak. Yeah, yeah. So I'm invited to conferences, go and give lectures. So, you know, quite a number of um, academic conferences around the world, um, going to speak at other parliaments. Um, sure, um so, um, and particularly in Europe, but also um, uh, Mexico, uh, uh, Canada, place like that. Um, uh, oh, Brazil, um, which is very much in the news at the moment, got a presidential election. Um, I was down, so I've been to Brazil. That was when they were going to hold a referendum on whether to change from a presidential to a parliamentary system. They wanted guidance on, you know, what the arguments for a parliamentary system. So being in Brazil was quite fascinating. So Brazil? Uh, yeah, cause, I mean, I'm... It was actually Brasilia where I was based, the capital, rather than Rio or Sao Paulo. Um, that was fascinating. Uh, the only downside is I don't like flying. And it's a bit difficult going to places like Hong Kong, Brazil, you know, Mexico, and obviously going regularly to the States. Um, you have to get on an aeroplane because I can't go by my favourite favorite means of travel, which is train. Right. So love trains, hate planes. So, you know, if I can avoid flying or long particularly hot long haul flights i do uh, if i get there by train i'm there like a shot so oh, right. if it's on the continent oh yeah i'll go around you know when i'm speaking in uh because i've been to rome to speak at the parliament i've been to rome because i was invited to speak at the vatican at a conference um you know, i was involved in a um a seminar um organized by the world bank for uh reform in iraq uh, the iraq parliament that was in Bern in switzerland so all those sorts of venues, it's great. I can get there by train. Yeah, by the- fantastic travel. I love it. So I'm a great fan of Eurostar. Um, so um, go all around continent as far as I can get by train is it, it, great. So if I can avoid flying, um, to be honest, I will. But because I get invited to different places, um, you know, being virtually around uh, different parts of the globe. Well, I'm just going to ask him. Have you, uh, yeah, I'm are, off. Are you wanting a five, ten minutes, or are you not no, got time? I'm, I'm off now, I'm afraid. I've got comparative legislatures to talk about Brazil. <laughs> As Lord Norton knows. I know him too. Well. Which is my, my my job. Job. Absolutely. You'd better go and do your yes. duty. So yes. you just need to, obviously, just press the record button when you're finished. And, yeah, yeah, and, sound. Uh, if you just leave the, if you leave the coloured phase up and the mics down, and obviously, uh, just, to, just to press the button to leave and it should lock behind you. Perfect. Cheers for that. No Champion. Worries. If you find it's not recorded anything at all. <laughs> I know. I'd it. cry. <laughs> Absolute cry would. Is the lovely voice is now in the podcast. <laughs> so, um, yeah, go down. So, what, how come you don't like flights? How come you don't like planes? Um, well, I'm acrophobic. I've got a fear of height, so I don't like going um, uh, height. It, it's, uh, but the worst thing for me is not so much... I think being in the plane or actually flying, it's actually turbulence I don't like. Yeah, right. It affects me. And I, for some reason, I seem to be on flights that seem to be badly affected. You know, I've got some, I've been on some that are really, you know, serious turbulence. I've been on a plane that had to abort a landing. I've been on a plane that had to abort a takeoff. Uh, and, you know, some that... Did I you said, get off and be like, yeah, that's no, not me today? Well, uh, well, the plane that had to abort, the, it just got to the end. Fortunately, it's a very small plane, so it's... Got to the end, it was just about to take off, and the pilot, you could suddenly realise, is applying the brakes, we're not taking off. And it's right at the end of the runway. Fortunately, it was a small plane, so it stopped before the end of the runway. So 
the others on the flight were looking absolutely horrified. A guy in front turned around. You know, <gasps> and there was me thinking, oh, God, we're not taking off. Um, so we transferred to another airport eventually, um, another airplane. But, um, yeah, and once I was coming in, I think it was to Gatwick, uh, the plane, there was a sudden explosion on the wing. I mean, hit by lightning, just as about to touch down. So, you know, engine roared and it pulls out of the land. It was just, a, you know, just that point where you know it's about to touch down and mm. all of a sudden power and up it went again there's, there's an audible gasp in the um plane oh wow so um so yeah so that's why you put off then <laughs> yeah and then sometimes i've been you know a number of times been hit by serious to like various times you know coming out of new york it, i thought oh this is um very smooth just having a cup of tea and all of a sudden the plane went up and down without any warning it's only when it everything teacups going all over that the <laughs> fastened seat belt signs went on which seemed a bit pointless after the event um and the pilot came and i'm sorry you may have noticed there's some thunderstorm activity in the area basically what had happened it driven in it flew into it right. um, <laughs> and then coming back from hong kong oh serious to, you know you know it's serious when the, ca- the captain says cabin crew take your seats so that's always a sign you belt in with it's going to be heavy turn. Well, either it means heavy turn, it's always going to try and climb out of it. Right. Um, but it was really heavy, and it came on and said something like, I'm sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. It's the sort of thing you expect when you're flying over the Himalayas. And I thought, that's no way to calm the passengers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, great, we're over this mountain range. What happens is the problem. So, yeah. So, anyway, I've never been that keen on flying, even though I had to do lots of it. But on a train, absolutely, I, I'm a great fan of train travel whenever I can you know a um, bit like going into Hull Paragon you just see a train down I always want to be on it <laughs> right <laughs> so have you ever played flown like first class and stuff like that um, rarely but um, once twice when it's been some organisation I remember someone going to Canada um, speaking at the Parliament um, and I think I, yeah I was booked I think into business but then I was bumped up to first class yeah, Which yeah. to anybody else, oh, wonderful first class. And I was sat there thinking, oh, I'd rather not be flying. <laughs> uh, yeah. Get me on that train. <laughs> yeah, and once when I had the, the trip I said about the States, when I was flying back from LA when we'd driven across, um, short notice getting a plane uh, flight. So the only one available, I think, was sort of business class, which fortunately wasn't that expensive. But otherwise, you know, it's just, um, just sitting in economy, just hoping that we land fairly soon. Yeah. Um, yeah. So with it, with trains then, is it um, all the trains you like, or is it like, have you ever like, yeah, gone on like these tours with like steam trains and stuff like oh, that? Oh, I've not been on one, but I've got um, uh, someone I know who's great, very much into uh, the old train steam travel, and so it keeps me informed when they're taking place. I mean, not normally free, but no, that, that, that is quite evocative, you know, the thought of going on one of the old steam trains and, yeah, yeah. you know, the having afternoon tea on the train and things like that. It's good. Oh, it's excellent, because I like that. Because uh, um, I do treat myself when I go on train travel, so first class or, you know, with um, Eurostar, they've got standard premier, which is great, because I can get an airline seat, which is what I always want, and be on my own, um, go on work if necessary. Yeah, they serve you breakfast, depends what time you're travelling, breakfast, things like that, it's wonderful. Oh, nice, nice, Love nice. It. And the continent as well is very nice in that respect as well. Um, you know, get trains where, well, they, they bring you drink, food, um, you know, well fed, very comfortable, get on with work. But oh, of course, you can see the countryside, see where you're going. Whereas if you're in a plane, oh, cloud, we're at an airport, yeah, yeah. from the airport. Well, on a train, you get a feel for the place. It can be well, quite scenic. I would um, just on one side. I went to Sweden once, and uh, on the plane, you, uh, like as it was coming down, you could see the whole horizon. Oh yeah, of, that. of Sweden, and Sweden's a very cold country. Didn't know this. Found out the hard way. Um, I'll tell you the story in a minute. But everything was just covered in snow. Yeah, it looked mm, immaculate. Like looked amazing. Oh, I think the experience. I mean, the I know what you mean. Because when flying into Hong Kong, it was daylight, so the pilot was circling Hong Kong. Because you oh, see that nice. fantastic view. So that was very nice. Now I'm keen to get on the ground. Um, but you can get the same with train travel because i remember once going to going to rome so taking the paris to milan express uh which actually managed to break down in an alpine village but that's the way um but we went through a 
you know, going through uh, the Alps, things like that. So it's fairly grey mountains, things like that. Went through a tunnel. Murtron Tunnel is a winter wonderland. It was all white. That I yeah. Was, and then what's happened here? I thought, you know, uh, went through another tunnel, came out. <laughs> it was completely oh, well, back to the old you know, mountains. No snow at all. It was absolutely remarkable. So it's fascinating things like that. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Nice, nice. So, I'll uh, last bit of the broadcast. I've wrote some things here. Yeah. So I've already uh, ticked off why the students uh, make a cake. Right. That was at the top of the list. Yeah. Because everyone uh, in the other room wanted to know. Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> well, follow me on Twitter if you want to see the products of the student cake making. They're, I'll, uh, they're brilliant. I'll tag it all in um, on a year. So, um, obviously, you've been real loyal to Hull, uh, Hull University. Yeah. Uh, and you've been here 45 years. I have, yeah. If you had the choice again to do it all over, what other university would you choose to stay at? Oh, uh, difficult to say, because I've not stayed at them long enough to really to feel, to, to know them well enough. I remember visited a lot, because obviously I speak at them, things like that. They're very attractive. Um, but... Um, I wouldn't be able to know simply because I'm so integrated into Hull and so familiar with all the conve- what I call the convenience of being here. Everything comes together so well in terms of the campus, what it offers, how I can work here, proximity to my home because I'm in walking distance, which is great, proximity to the city, what that can lay on, um, and train travel, it's easy to get around, things like that. So um, it comes together so well. Uh, and easy now with whole trains to get directly from here to London. Um, so I'm not sure anywhere else. I don't have sufficient familiar, familiarity with anywhere else to know whether it's been able to really compete with Hull in terms of those conveniences. Mm. So they might look quite attractive, but you don't know um, whether you get the conveniences. And of course, we've got the I suppose we've got the benefit that stress to students, you know, good quality and high quality education at the university. But of course, you're living in an area which is not high cost. Yeah, one so of the can, cheapest. Yeah, isn't it, uh, yeah. So you can live well in Hull, which is a great boon, of course. So you know, really have a reasonable lifestyle. Of course, I live in London as well. Um, and so you've got a house, yeah, in London. Yeah, I own a f- flat in London. Um, so I've got yeah two homes. I just moved between the two, so I'm familiar with the contrast. So it's great being in London. Of course, more expensive, but the pace of life is very different. But it's great to be back in Hull. Yeah, yeah. Because particularly at weekends, because uh, I work at weekends and go on my research, but it's a totally different environment. It's very nice. So, yeah, so the contrast is notable, but the two come together well. And again, that's part of, if you like, what I call the conveniences of uh, how uh, my life works with being in Hull. So yeah, yeah. I don't know it could be replicated anywhere else. Right. Um, and I never felt the need to take the risk because. Um, because other people move on either because they're offered more money or yeah, for prestige and I'm not really interested in either as long as I can do the job I really want to do and enjoy it and productive that's the main thing that you're enjoying life being productive not you know because people offer you more money because that has happened and I'm not that being that interested I'm yeah just, yeah it's the quality of the work that really matters I think when yeah. it gets up to your level in your your the line of success I don't think money can really buy buy you i think no, exactly. obviously like yes yeah, yeah as long as i got enough i can you know, pay for my train and, yeah. <laughs> and, and books basically because that's all i'm really interested in then you know that's it um i can get on and do what i enjoy doing yeah 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 no it's interesting to, to see because obviously like you know a lot of people start somewhere or use this as like a step oh stone absolutely yeah to yeah. go to the next yes yeah. but once i found somewhere i feel yeah that's great that's for me I stick with it, whatever it is. So whether it's work environment, friends, because my friends have had donkeys years, you know, it's great. Um, uh, even when I go for meals, it's <laughs> a creature of habit. Once I find somewhere, you know, and other things I do, once I find somewhere I think that's great, that's for me, I stick with it because I can then be very productive. It creates the right environment for me to thrive. Yeah, yeah. So that leads on to another question I've just made from that. Yeah. <laughs> you just uh, give me a spark of idea. So are you saying like yeah, you're loyal to all these places? Is there a restaurant in Hull you're always loyal to? Is that, there a place where you always visit? Oh, yeah, there used to be, and they closed it, it just after the pandemic. Um, 
Uh, so yeah, I tend to go to different the other various places. I once I found somewhere comfortable with. Um, the only problem, you know, restaurants and that sometimes they close. Yeah, yeah. What was your favourite one? What was it called? Oh, well, there were various ones. Um, quite simply, there was the Coupland's Orchard Cafe on Paragon Street. Um, uh, that was my sort of Saturday regular. So I found another one. Um, and just recently down Newland Avenue, uh, Ponte's, which was very nice, uh, quite regular there. That closed. Um, so Is yeah. it not a... Uh, is it Ponte? The pon- it was Ponte's that became... It's now an airdresser's. Uh, right, because there's, there's something called Ponto in town, which is near the water display. Oh, right, yeah. That's like literally oh, my I know local. the one you mean. Oh, right, yeah, I know the one you mean. No, this was new. Fabulous. Yeah. There. Oh, there are. Once I, I mean, I explore, cause then, as I say, some you think, oh, that's okay, but then you, I go to one thing, ah, right, found it, that's for me, and stick with it. I will recommend you one down Humber Street, because Humber Street's my favourite place. Yeah. It's like where I've like built my career. Yeah. Um, it's called... Um, flower uh, and feast just like a little like cafe yep. inside or everything is homemade like everything yep. from scratch oh, right. so like the bags you get yep. like the you see the logo they've yep. stamped that in the morning so they'll stamp bags they'll like make the bread everything you see yeah it's just like freshly baked inside yeah well as long as i mean if they want to find food i like and the environment because that's always very important. It's not just yeah, yeah. food, but nice, comfortable. I'm a great fan of tea shops, basically, and things like that. Uh, and I can sit there comfortably, you know, nice. I mean, I'm a, I drink. The other thing, I, I'm an incessant tea drinker. I always have been. Um, I'm teetotal. I don't I touch alcohol, but I'll just incessantly drink tea. So finding somewhere that serves yeah, nice cups of tea, I'm quite spoiled for choice because there are several places do um yeah i'm quite happy you know nice meal good cup you know well cup of tea pots of tea um and i work so i always take reading things to get on with while i'm yeah, doing yeah. it so it just makes for a great environment you're like you'll probably like my next one though i'm actually doing a tea tea workshop oh, uh, right. liquid um uh, this uh, a local um uh, tea maker's coming in she's gonna uh, put it all on the desk here and yeah. she's gonna make different teas oh, right. we're gonna try yeah. different ones yeah so if you're available, oh yeah, you so, could be the you could I, be the guinea pig on it. Right, well I've got loads of blends at home that I buy. It. So yeah, I've got my favourite sort of blends that, um, yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm up to that. <laughs> <laughs> so we've done it. Um, so oh, so that goes on for the next one. What made you choose Hull? Was it because you were obviously born here, or was it no, just no. by chance? By chance, they advertised there was a job. It's, I can't remember. Maybe the only job advertised in a politics department that year. But there, there was a job advert I saw, so I thought, right, I'll apply, and did, and it all took off from there. No, oh, what was it on? Was it newspaper or was it an yeah, advertisement? Oh, oh yeah, in those days, yeah. Um, that's a good question. Which publication it was in but um yeah in those days there was some you know guardian time was it the times guardian um would carry adverts for you know job vacancies and education because i think now it's like everything's on indeed it, or online it's, it's online and yeah. it's a shark tank between cvs yeah there's a set there's, there's a particular site in particular that advertises yeah. academic jobs, and then yeah. your cv might not even get seen so it's yeah. the competition now is like yeah oh, shark tank. yeah um so uh, so this is a good one. So, at what point in your life did you feel the most accomplished? At what point where it was like you look back and you're like, "Yeah, I've I've made it now." Because I think yeah, you've that, made the point, yeah, and then absolutely. you've gone above yeah. and beyond. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a very good question. Um, what I do reflect on, um, you know, because people say, what, "What's the best time of your life?" And the normal answer is now. Yeah, because you wouldn't want to do, undo anything. So you keep adding to it. You've reached the yeah you know, where you are now. Um, so in recent years is probably the time when I feel I'm not quite sure what's the right word. Most relaxed, most content with life in terms of what I've achieved. I mean, I, I'm, a friend of mine keeps reminding me I'm an archetypal introvert. Cause I, like my own company, very happy on my own, being le- like being left alone, just to go on, <laughs> right. get on with my work. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, and so I'm very comfortable, and I've, yeah, in recent years I've been particularly comfortable 
just getting on on my own. Yeah, yeah. Um, Opposite um, to me then. Oh, right, <laughs> Absolute yeah. ultra fair. Yeah, sort of. I've got a lot of friends like that. Um, uh, and during the pandemic, I was probably able to cope quite well, simply because I was at home, got my study, could get on with my research, perfectly content. So I didn't, you know, I'm not one who must rush out and have social, in, you know, I've got very close friends who keep in close contact with meet up, things like that. But um, I'm not, a great socializer and i'm quite content yeah i say uh with my own company just getting on with work in fact i'm at my most yeah, happiest just in my uh office or my study with my books getting on with the research obviously i've got a pot of tea to hand as well um then <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah that for me is the ideal yeah yeah so what age would you have said what, what age did you reach to and you believe he was like oh I've... oh um and most companies, I suppose, um, actually, probably, I mean, it's probably recent years, actually. So, particularly 50s, 60s. Mm. Where you could look back and be like, oh. Well, I don't, not so much look back. It's more, don't want to be too wretched, it's more looking at where I am now and feeling fine. You know, I've reached, you know, a peak. Not more. like uh, and then, and then well, you've got no, no, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like the idea of a peak because the implication is, as you say, you go down the other side. Um, you just keep adding to it, but it's sort of yeah. feeling um, content sounds a bit too complacent. Um, but if you're like satisfied, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, with one way, with what one has, yeah, the position one's reached. Because um, because you, you are an amazing like you know individual like everyone I've talked to about you saying you're coming on the show and stuff like everyone knows and everyone was like excited to like hear sort of oh, thing right, yeah because like obviously like um, like because you're in politics and stuff like that I didn't want to be at like debates and your opinions on this I wanted it to be about obviously your life and the start of it sort of thing oh right well um, yeah it's but it's grown it's added to I've been it I'm just um, I mean, people think, well, you know, what skills do you need? Well, you need skills, ability. It helps if you're organised. Um, but um, exploit opportunities. But at the same time, luck comes into it, I'm afraid. Um, you know, because being at the right place at the right time, you know, I was fortunate because a job came along at a particular time, something came up, you know, I was able to apply for it. But if the jobs don't come up, there's nothing to apply for. So mm. I'm just fortunate in the way that things have happened when they have happened, obviously you need to show initiative, you need to apply, you know, put yourself forward, but I'm not a great one for pushing myself forward in that sense. Are you not? Uh, no, I've hardly ever applied for anything. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah, it's more a case of do your best, show your skills, others will recognise it. Yeah, right. And things come along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's a bit like peerages. We always say that um, rather than, because you can self-nominate for a peerage for the House of Lords Appointments Commission. And uh, I take the view that, you know, somebody else should recognise your skills, not you recognising them yourself, saying yeah, yeah. how good you are. So, you know, if you show you're really up to it, you've got talent, if you've got some, um, then, you know, others will recognise it rather than you going around... Sing, yeah, yeah. singing about yourself because you are a role model to a lot of other people so that follows into my next question is there any role models you look up to or is there any like idols that have helped shape yeah. you well I've never seen myself simply because I'm so me I just get on and do what I do um, and I'm conscious um, you know I'm just me so um, and might be considered a little odd Um and I'm conscious I don't have any role models. Yeah. Say, who's, I was once asked, when I was, cause I do lots of schools visits, and um, one, uh, yeah, they asked me a question about the constitution. I'm perfectly happy, you know, really, oh, yeah, I can answer that, blah, blah. And the final question was, you know, if you could have dinner with five historical figures, live or dead, who would they be? I don't agree if that's the most difficult question. I've no idea I particularly want to have dinner with anybody. So, um, but if you had a cup of tea and a, and a cake with one of them, then? I'd be quite happy having a cup of tea or cake on my own. Because um, <laughs> uh, I'm not one of these who has here. You know, you think, who's your hero? And I, well, actually, I don't know. I've got a particular, you know, you learn from so many people. There's not one person. And people are different. So it's sort of picking from different people what they've 
down you know particular skills what you learn from them rather than or oh, there i put that particular person on a pedestal Mm. So lots of people who've been absolutely brilliant, I can never emulate them. It's one of the advantages of being in the House of Lords. You mix with so many peers who have achieved such things in life. You know, Nobel Prize winner, you know, they've done this, they've done that, and great things, and you're, you're sort of in awe of them. So it's just great being there, and it keeps you modest, because you think, oh, great, I could never do anything you know, like that. They're mm. either tremendously brilliant at something, or they're tremendously brave or tremendous initiative in what they've created i think i could never do any of that so in awe of them but not one where you think oh that's the hero of the role model they're just all uh outstanding so it, you know you can pick up from it's sort of learning from a range of people rather than just feel i must be like that or following the footsteps of that particular individual so you know one can be inspired, but inspired by a lot of people rather than just, you know, one or two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. you feel you must emulate or revere. Yeah, because there's, like, there's probably two that I, like, follow, which is, like, Grant Cardone and um, Kozaki, which is, like, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, wrote those books. Is there anyone who could, like, just spit out the top of your tongue where, like, they'll come to you? No, because, I mean, there's um, not one person. It, it's more the problem is there are so many who really, because, you know, my, in my work, lots of people inspired me, their books, I've read them and think, wow, that's a really great point. But there's lots of them. Mm. Um, and in politics as well, some great figures, um, some pretty hopeless ones as well. Um, but it, Don't name the hopeless ones. No, um, <laughs> uh, but it's sort of analysing them and, and seeing... Uh, my role is not to sort of think, oh, they're my heroes. It's more to analyse and think, well, what can we learn from them? What are the key skills you need to succeed? You know, what makes for a... What skills do a prime minister have? What do skills ministers have? Different types. So I spend my time analysing rather than feel, you know, these are people I must emulate. Mm. So going on to the bookcase, uh, back to that topic with, have you read every single book on the bookcase... Or is this some that you need to catch up on? Well, my general view is that, I mean, the reason I buy them, I know what's in them. As soon as they arrive, I'll try and gut them, you know, immediately go through them to see what's in them, what's particularly relevant for my purposes. So even if I've not read them all, I like to think I know what's in every, you know, I know what's in them for, for the purpose of research so I can get them off the shelf when I need them. At the moment, I need to rearrange them all in order because <laughs> since the transfer, they're all on the shelves, but... Not necessarily like the right order. alphabetically, or is it no, no, like... it's thematically because oh, I have my par- you know, parliament section, government section, uh, things like that. So, uh, political parties, different parties. So, uh, no, it's organized thematically. So, once I've got them reorganized, um, I'll I'll know where they are. Each should, one is, yeah. You should uh, volunteer one of your students, that'd be a, that'd be a no, task and a half, but it's a major, it's a major exercise because it's. Yeah, there's there's lots. I can imagine. <laughs> uh, so, uh, is there any uh, particular book that's been your favourite? No, I mean I've admired some. I mean either of my own. I mean one or two of mine have proved to be classics, but in the sense of they've been around for a long time and people have read them, not because I regard them as classics. Um, what are the titles? Well, the ones that are particularly well known, uh, Constitution in Flux, is one for which I'm particularly. Uh, well known the British Polity is the one that sold well in the States because it's written for American students Politics UK is the one that's most uh, now in its 10th edition most widely sold in this country for uh, uh, student texts Um, and then the most recent single authored one not my most recent book last one but three I think uh, called Governing Britain which has done it very well Um, apparently the print run sold out within two weeks so um, amazing um, and published did a fantastic job it's so well produced and it's in hard cover and yet it's, a, it's only it's something like 16.99 which for book price is hard cover is great so uh, but that's the most recent single authored one so I'm particularly pleased um, so has books that. gone down in value there or did they used to be real expensive they're expensive now yeah or so are they cheap back well, they were less expensive, been. yeah, because in my day, you know, when you started, they were didn't cost that much, whereas book prices have um, gone up quite uh, considerably, yeah. Mm. And, and it's certain for particular disciplines, it's some are particularly pricey, yeah. 
I just pay a subscription for audiobook and just sit back and <laughs> oh yeah well nowadays <laughs> listen so much, so much online get on Kindle yeah, yeah. But, if you uh, put a book in my face like this I'd be like oh no I still like the physical going on the bookshelf and things like that yeah 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 I mean it's it's that, that rep- you can look at it and think that's a repository of knowledge and just aesthetically I mean a book lined um, study I think is just so aesthetically attractive and it just conveys you know learning knowledge it's all there at your disposal so would you say reading a book is better than listening to a book I would but that's no no it's... I've always I mean that's simply because that's the way I've always operated I read it rather than listen cause he, and then I know where it is on a page You, I think you memorise it better but yeah. I haven't that much experience so do you, do you highlight it and stuff like that when you've oh no I'd never deface a book <laughs> you wouldn't disrespect a book like that <laughs> um, so from obviously books and quotes and stuff um, is there any quotes you live by any famous quotes not that I use I'm students I think know me because I use certain phrases apparently any uh, ones you've well I, I tend to explain that something is necessary uh, uh, necessary but not sufficient that's one of my uh, apparently um do use that regularly and um, there are probably one or two others uh, as well so they know when it's me writing um my familiar style yeah yeah no no so believe yep so we've already asked for the work of the uni so that's all ticked on my book of questions excellent <laughs> um is there anything you want to uh, point on? No, uh, no, no. I don't, um, no, I think the same thing I said would probably sound too self-serving. So no, 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 go, go, go. No, no, I the, can't. The think, it's all right, I can't think of anything anyway uh, <laughs> that you've not covered. No, thank you. Thank you very much for obviously being a part of the My pleasure. stuff. Thank you for being here. Yeah, that's everything from myself. I'll uh,